I think we did 4 minus squared 4 minus x domain. Did something like that. Yep, we did the domain of square root 4 minus x. So we use that domain and graph it. So we're going to do the clueless method. We know something about the domain, so we're going to use that domain to uh, pick our values. That was negative infinity to positive 4. So we'll start at 4, and then positive 4, and then go to uh, some negative value. We'll see. So we got x. We're going to do something a little weird. I'll start at positive 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So here we have square root 4 minus x, which is square root 0. That's 0. 4 minus 3 is 1. Square root is 1. 2 minus 4 minus 2 is 2. So that's square root 2. 4 minus 1 is 3, square root 3, 4 minus 0 is 4, square root 4, which is 2. Let's go ahead and graph these points right here. And we need a lot more negative x values, so graph out like this, positive 4, we have 0. Positive 3, we have 1. Positive 2, we'll skip that. We'll go right to 0. We have our y-intercept at 2. So we could keep going. Our next, what is our next good x value that has a nice square root? So obviously we need square root 9, which is 3, but what x value gives us 9? Negative, yeah, 4 minus negative 5 is positive 9. All right, so if we went to negative 5, we'll be up at 3. And we can connect these together. We have to stop at positive 4. We don't get to keep going to the right because that's our domain. The end of our domain is right there. Now we put an arrow going to the left because our domain right here keeps going to negative infinity. So we don't have an end going to the negative side. So there is our graph. Now if you remember transformations and the original square root function, There's the original square root function, really briefly, and it was reflected, horizontal reflection, and then shifted right 4. Well, depending on the order you do it, you should probably shift right 4 and then reflect. But I'm not going to go through all the detailed transformations, but that was pre-calculus 1 right there. So even in odd functions, we'll do even first. So we have an even function, definition, what this means. f of negative x is the same as f of regular x. So if you plug in a negative value, it's the same thing as if you uh, plugged in a regular positive value. So that's what it looks like. The symmetry will be x-axis symmetry, no, y-axis symmetry. And an example, the easiest, well, the easiest non-trivial example will be x squared. And the reason they call it even is because any time you have a polynomial that has only even powers, you get an even function. So if all your powers of x are even, you plug in negative, and it will be the same as plugging in positive.
Only if you have an odd power does that uh, matter that you put a negative value in. So easy example is x squared. You could go plus x to the 6, and you plug in negative x. Negative x squared is regular x squared. Negative x to the 6 is regular x to the 6. So any polynomial with even, co uh, even powers is going to be an even function. Let's undo that plus x to the 6. So I can graph this function very easily. It's a happy parabola. It looks like that. And you can see the y-axis symmetry right there on the parabola. Odd function, if you plug in negative x, instead of getting just fx, you get negative f of x. So you plug in a negative input, and your output's negative. And here you get origin, symmetry, So there are a few easy examples. The easiest example is x to the first power. First power is odd. But that's not a very exciting function. So let's go with the next biggest odd number, which is x cubed. It's a little more exciting function. The cubic function looks like this right here. So origin symmetry, you want to think about it like a propeller. There's the origin. And if you rotate halfway, 180 degrees or pi around the origin, you will get the same exact graph. So I think of it like a propeller. Spin it around, get the same thing. Uh, you can also reflect, but it's a weird reflection. It's a reflection through the origin. So if you really want to think about reflecting through the origin, I'll use the green pen here. So what is reflecting through the origin? You're going to look where the origin is and you keep going the same distance out on the other side. So that's what a reflection through the origin actually looks like. The effect is you rotate halfway. So wherever your point is, you just go that amount past the origin in the same direction and you end up with that second point right there. And the only point that doesn't move, the origin, stays exactly where it is. So that is origin symmetry with an example. And now types of functions. So we have linear function. So f of x equals mx plus b. And if your m equals 0, you have a horizontal line like that. If your slope is 1 and your intercept is 0, so f of x equals just x. So you definitely don't have horizontal line because your slope's not 0. Uh, this is what we call the identity function. So that's linear power. P of x for power function. So this looks like a number times x to a power. We looked at the power function in pre-calculus 1, where we looked a is even or odd, and if c was positive or negative. So there's four possibilities, and we'll look at that again uh, when we get there. So a is a, an integer. Well, it's a positive integer. And 
and C is any real number. So I should talk about what are these weird symbols I just wrote down. If you weren't in my pre-calculus classes, the weird Z and the weird R. We'll write those down right now. So this Z in set notation it looks like this it's all the whole numbers positive and negative so that's Z if I put a plus on it that means the positive ones and sometimes zero is included sometimes it's not depending on the situation it says Z plus real numbers you cannot write them all out but you can describe them so this is all real numbers that's probably the only numbers that we need for this class we had complex numbers but we won't be using them in this quarter so we don't need to worry about those. There are rational numbers, but I don't think there's only a couple things we do where we need a rational number, not a real number. So, yeah, it's symbol, this weird symbol right here, this is an epsilon, and this means uh, lives in or is an element of. So this is a math sentence, and this reads, x is an element of the real numbers. So that's what that sentence means if you write it all out. x is an element of the real numbers, or x is a real number. So now we can read up here. This says that A is a positive integer and C is a real number. And if I write R with a plus, this means all positive real numbers. So the reason, there's many reasons to write in a math notation. One of the uh, big ones is that you don't have to spend as much time actually writing things out because it makes your notation a lot more compact. Any computer science people, majors, potential. So you're gonna find out if you're majoring or if you just take a few classes in computer science, when you actually go to write, you're gonna write in math a lot more efficiently than you're gonna write in computer science. Uh, one of the big reasons is there's no epsilon key on the keyboard. So you can never type in something like x is an element of the real numbers. You'll generally have to spell out most of these things in computer science. So if you are going to computer science, it's actually more important you learn math notation so you can write things down much more quickly when you actually come to uh, writing out your thoughts. Uh, math is a language that's been around for hundreds, well, really thousands of years. Computer languages have been around maybe 40, well, realistically, not even really 40 in their modern form. So they're they're just baby languages. Power. All right, we're going polynomial next. Polynomial. You could define polynomial as a sum of power functions, different powers, different coefficients. And we'll just write it as, uh, I think the letters we used before. So this looks like a bunch of coefficients times x to different powers. My n's tend to look like u's. Sometimes it's 
So there's polynomial right there. You have to make sure your first coefficient is not zero. And all of your AKs are real numbers for all K. And I want to get more notationally lazy, so we're going to introduce the upside down A means all. So we write AK, the upside down A, that means for all the K values. Now which K values do I mean? All the K values, K equals 1, 2, 3, up to, oh, actually 0 as well. So specifically, all these, everything I just underlined right there. So that AK just represents every single one of those coefficients. And I'm just saying all of those individually are real numbers. What does that funky be with that dash? So that's an upside down A. That means all. Gotcha. And while we're on it, there's one more that I can think of off the top of my head. backwards E, you can't turn E upside down, but you turn it backwards, and that means there exists. I'll try to go over these when I use them, hopefully, and if I don't, just say, hey, what is that weird symbol, and I'll tell you what it is. So we got polynomial. Rational and algebraic are the last two. So rational is a ratio of polynomials. Where P of X, Q of X are polynomials. Last up, algebraic. Basically, these are uh, rational functions with fractional powers. So what do fractional powers get us? They get us all the roots, basically. So you can have half power, third power, fifth power, and all that. What we are not going to do is exponential and logarithmic. We'll do that in Calc 2. So you can cross out exponentials and logs uh, for this quarter. So that's the end of 1.1. Unfortunately, I can't keep the previous notes on the board when I switch sections, which is at least not a way that I see to do that. So if you get cut off right there, just leave some space, whatever you thought you needed. A good thing to do if you use loose leaf paper is just stop writing on the page you're on and start your next section on the next page. That's a good thing to do overall. So you start all your notes at the top, 
but that also leaves you basically as many sp spots as you want to put extra papers in there. So if you find out you need an extra six pages of notes for some weird reason, because something was super confusing, you can drop six extra pages in your notebook. So all, most of the paper we use comes from Oregon and Washington, so feel free to use it, local economy and all that good stuff. Uh, don't be shy with paper. So we'll look at combining functions first with the basic operations, and then we'll go to composition. So addition, this is just take whatever f would do to x and whatever g would do to x and then add those two together. And same thing with minus. And we'll do the same thing with multiplication. Multiplication, you have to be a little careful with the notation because function composition uses a circle dot, which looks very similar to this dot. Uh, and this dot looks exactly like the dot product dot. So you really have to know what the objects are that uh, are on either sides of the dots. So you got two functions on the sides of the dots, you're most likely doing multiplication. You got two vectors, a vector on each side, you're probably doing the dot product. Now if you have a vector function, you better know what you're doing at that point but that's calc three. So this is times, a lot of times we don't even put a multiplication symbol in there. And last up, my least favorite word is division. It's f of x divided by g of x. And of course this is when you're not divided by zero. So that function is not going to be defined anytime g is zero. Now we have composition. Write it as f composed of g. What this means is function f is going to go first. No, g's going first. And then after that, f is going to go. So we take an x right here, and the first function that inputs that is g, so we can write it as g of x, the first thing that happens. Now we have a slight problem over here. The question is, does g, so g of x lands in the domain of g, and then the right uh, circle, the right set here is the range of f, but generally the domain of g is not going to be equal to the domain of f. So they're not going to be perfectly aligned. So depending on where g of x is, if g of x is inside the domain, whoa, that's not the domain of g. Oh no. There is a domain of g, but it's not that one. Which circle is a domain of g? Which circle is the domain of G? So first one on the left or on the right? First one on the left is domain of G. What is the range of F? Range, the output of F. So furthest on the right. 
All right, now we'll go to the two center circles. Let me make them more reasonably sized. So the one on the left is the range, the output of G. The one on the right is the domain of F. And what we need to do is make sure the output of the G function is a valid input for the F function. So the part of this that we actually want to use, we'll go with green. I really just want to use this inside part right here. And of course that is the intersection of the two, the part I shaded in. Easier drawn and said than actually computed. So the way we write this out, G8 first, so G eats the X first, and then F eats the output of the G of X operation. So it's a little weird, we read left to right, but in math we generally evaluate inside to outside. So you evaluate this first. And then you F it. And we can write down the, uh, so the domain of G, if we look carefully, a lot of the domain of G might end up in this bad part right here. So we actually have to come through and edit the domain of G. So I really only want a part of the domain of G right here. So how do we trim this down carefully? I want the part, the domain of G, that lands in uh, right over here, the second green football shape right there. So now we'll look at the domain of f of g. Another way we can write this, you draw a big circle between the two, and that means of or composition. Not to be confused with the small circle that we drew for multiplication. All right, so how in the world do we do this domain of f of g of x? So first of all, it's all x in the domain of G such that, so it's not all of them, but it's we can start out with all of them and we're going to throw away the ones that are bad, such that G of X is in the domain of F, such that the output of the G function is inside the valid inputs for F. If we write it in set builder notation, so we could draw from the domain of G, X is in the domain of G such that G of X is in the domain of F. We'll do a domain, uh, function composition and domain problem.
get crazy. We'll go 1 over 9 minus x squared. Okay, so using just the definition of the domain here, let's go ahead and figure out what's the domain of G first. That's step one. And we should be able to finish domain of G, no problem, in this class, and then tomorrow we'll finish the rest of the domain. All right, domain of G, what do I need to watch out for in G of X? No square roots. So, yep, three's bad, and what else? Negative. Negative three. So plus minus three, you could write it. Oh, if I factor three minus x, three plus x is how it's going to factor as difference of squares or conjugates. So I could write all except positive three and negative three. So interval notation. Sometimes interval notation can be a little tricky. So if you r actually draw your number line, there's negative three, there's positive three. Those are the two bad ones I want to take out. And then you just have to think about what is in between. And if you think in this way, of course, infinity and negative infinity are the ends of the number line. I like to think of cutting a carrot into you're making two cuts, so you get three pieces. And if you draw it out, it should make a lot of sense. Just make sure your order small on the left, big on the right. So there's your domain G.